There is a river that flows from the throne of God in heaven and it actually flows right through heaven. And quite often people who die and, uh, and, uh, and not quite ready for all of so many of the things of heaven, God takes them through that river in heaven. And as they go through that river, changes, great changes um, occur in their lives and makes them more compatible with the things around them in heaven. And that river flows from the throne of God, it flows right through heaven, it flows out through paradise and uh, the outer courts of heaven. And uh, it is an incredible river, a river which you can swim in, you can walk in, you can breathe under water in it. It is a river which regenerates. It is a river of life which flows from God himself. But you know, God has indicated very, very clearly in his word <coughs> that he wants that river to flow into the earth. Not just for heaven. There is a spiritual flow of God's life and power that river that flows from the throne of God, God wants us to begin to experience in our own personal lives, in our lives, and corporately as we meet together and out into the world, God intends for that river to flow. And as we were praying on, on Friday night, and we started to get somewhat really into the night, and people were praying and seeking the face of the Lord, we opened up a river that began to flow into this place. Now, it wasn't a great flow, it was just an opening of a river coming down into this place. And I believe that if we continue to pray and continue to see, the force of that river will increase and the waters will begin to rise. You know, the Bible talks about waters to the ankles, waters to the knees, waters to swim in. And I believe that if we continue to seek God and begin to pray and uh, not lose our focus and keep praying for the same thing and reach out to God, that river will begin to rise in our midst. And uh, I want to encourage you with that because, you know, it was a, it was a good prayer meeting and, and, and there were about 30 of us stayed through the night just to pray, take hold of God and um, bring it in. Now we're going to have that every week and so bear that in mind every week, but we're kind of seeking the face of the Lord. And so something was opened up in the, in the realm of the Spirit, that river began to make a way through. It's a bit like, you know, the, the Mandarin Dam. It just started to trickle at first, but then it increased and it increased and it increased. And God wants to do that. He wants to flow and, uh, into our midst. The river in the Bible nearly always speaks of life or a source of life and power of God. In the book of Revelation 20, 22 and verse 1 it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, and it proceeded out of the throne of God. You see, and it began to flow, flow through heaven. It says in, in verse 2, And in the midst of the street of it, and on the side of the river, was, there was a tree, a tree of life, which bore twelve manner of fruit, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. How many of you know that God has died to flow in, the heal, in the healing the nations of the world today? There's some incredible things beginning to happen in the Muslim world. You know, a few years ago, there were a Muslim world, there was many visions and dreams, and, and Muslim people were having revelations of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is intensifying like never before. It's like there's a whole new wave sweeping through the Muslim world. There's a whole new river of God. You see, it's for the healing of the nations. God is touching nations. The same has happened through Russia. Many of those places we need to pray for Russia because Russia is not going to stay open forever. But we need to pray to see millions of people have come into the kingdom of God where that river began to flow. Now we need a river flowing in our lives. We need it in this church. We need it in this city. The river of God um, beginning to flow because it brings growth. It brings healing. It brings life. You see there's trees there. The tree of life. It brings fruit. Psalm 46 verse 4 says, There is a river. The streams whereof make glad the house of God, or the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. And it's a very interesting verse of scripture that in Psalms, and it's talking about Psalm 46, for there is a river that makes glad the city of God. I mean, if you know that this city is not glad, <laughs> and uh, we need a river that will flow into this city to make glad, you see. The background of that scripture is very, very interesting. It, it, it's dealing with the days of Hezekiah. And uh, Hezekiah, because of the constant invasion of Israel and the surrounding of the city um, with foreign, foreign, the enemy, foreign troops and so on, 
And 2 Kings 20 and verse 20 says, and says, the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and all his might, and how he made a pool and a conduit and brought water into the city. Are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? What he did, he cut a tunnel through solid rock. In fact, that tunnel is there today. You know, they've excavated it and that tunnel is still there today. And he cut a tunnel through solid rock underground, under the wall of the city, and brought water into the city. So that they, the, the source of water, which was their life, couldn't be cut off by the enemy. And that's what David was referring to. There is a river that makes glad the city of God. He was referring to this, what Hezekiah did. It brought joy and provision and uh, life into the city. Okay. So there is a river that flows from the very throne of God that brings life and healing and blessing and revival. And I want to encourage you today because, uh, you know, it was, it was clear that uh, on Friday night, or what would be Saturday morning, wasn't it? It's 3 o'clock in the morning. But that river, there was a river, there was a break in the river and it began to flow just into the back there and down the aisle. Just a trickle. I want to tell you, if we keep praying, that will increase. God wants to do something. Okay. You know, in Ezekiel, God, you got your Bible open to Ezekiel chapter 47. First of all, chapter 47 speaks of a great river, the river that flowed from God's throne. And it depicts a great end time move of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 47 verse 1 says, Afterwards he brought me to the door of the house, and behold, waters issued from under the threshold of the house eastward. And so we see there was a river that flowed from the, the presence of the throne of God under the threshold, and it began to bring life. And this this temple here of Ezekiel has never been built. There are detailed um, instructions given, architectural details given, but it has never been literally built. Okay, And it was speaking of an end time move of the Holy Spirit. And so it's an interesting um, passage of scripture, it's an interesting kind of setting. There's quite a number of chapters, you know, which deal with this. Now, Ezekiel had prophesied in, in Ezekiel in chapter 24 that the temple would be destroyed, the house of the Lord would be destroyed. And he used the analogy of his wife and so on, how that the and, and it was how that the temple would be destroyed. Now we come down as and that 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 happened, literally happened. The invasion took place. The temple was destroyed and so on. But we find that in in chapter 40 um, we have the plans begin chapter 40 right through to chapter 43. Um, he, Ezekiel has given plans, detailed plans for another temple. Now that was never built. They did build a restoration temple after that, but these, the plans for this temple weren't used. There's a totally different um, layout, and there are four chapters there which give very kind of detailed, architectural detail or description of um, this temple and its surrounds and its, and its layout. And uh, this Ezekiel's temple here represents, it is a picture, whether it will be literally built in the millennium is open for speculation. I don't know whether they're built. They've got the plans here in these chapters, but whether it will be built is another thing. Um, I, I, I wouldn't even try and speculate in that because there's nothing clear really on scripture whether that will be built in the end times. But the plan is there and the detail is there. And I believe that was given because this temple is a picture of the end time church. It describes the, the, minute, the life of Jesus and his death and resurrection. But most prophecies deal with that. The death and resurrection of Jesus and the atoning work and all that. But beyond that, it speaks of the house of God in the end times. And from this house flowed a river. And uh, we need to appreciate that because the days that we are now living in is the time for this to be built. And uh, how many of you know that there's a whole new church arising around the world? A different kind of church is arising. God is shaking everything down that can be shaking. There's a building. There are new wineskins. There's a building of a new kind of house of the Lord uh, according to the pattern. And uh, this Ezekiel's temple really kind of speaks about this. And so we need to look at some of the key statements. Or some of the key scriptures. We can't deal with them all. But at least some of the scriptures around this time. What Ezekiel saw and what the Lord told Ezekiel um, about this temple. And so, if we come to chapter 43, 
And uh, we look at that, we, we, there's some key scriptures in there which we need to understand. And verse 6 of verse 5 says, So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and I beheld the glory of the Lord filled the house. And I heard him speaking um, unto me out of the house. And the man stood before me. Well, we don't know if this was a human spirit, someone of the old, who had died and gone to be with the Lord, whether it was an angel or whether it was one of the Old Testament prophets who had gone on before him. But he said, a man stood before me and said unto me, the place of my throne, he's talking in place of God, the place, son of man, he said, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredoms nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. He said, okay, he said, now God is saying, I'm going to build a house where my feet will stand. That's what he's saying, the house, my throne, where my throne will be established, where my river will flow, where I will dwell in the midst of of the children of Israel, I will dwell in the midst of you. And he said, no more it shall be defiled. How did they defile it? In verse 8, the next verse it says, by setting of their threshold alongside my threshold. What was he saying here? And um, their post by my post, and their wall between me and them, and they have defiled my holy name. Now what was he saying? In the context he's talking about the house of the Lord. And he said, no more. He said, I'm going to build a house in these days, the days of Ezekiel's temple, where my throne will be established, where my feet shall stand, where my presence shall be. And he said, no more will they defile it by building their house alongside my house and calling it the house of the Lord. Understand now what I'm saying? He said, this will be the place where my feet is, where, where I will dwell. You see, the church, the church or man so often has set up his church, his work and called it God's house. And there are many, many things that God has been shaking down over the last 10 years and he will continue to shake because they were not built in God. Oh, they were built and they were called the house of the Lord and they set their threshold, their throne, their place, their house alongside his and called it the house of God. And God said, I'm going to shake all that kind of thing down. And uh, that which man has built, when they called it God's house, or God's dwelling, or God's work, he said, I'm going to destroy. Or it will go into, just fall down into oblivion, obscurity. But he said, in these days, I'm going to build my house. Where my throne will be, where my feet will stand, and my river will flow from that house of the Lord. And so often, through we are seen so often, men have built things and called them God's work. God says, I'm no longer going to allow that. And he said unto me, it'll be a place where my feet dwell. He said, they have set their thresholds by my threshold, their post by my post, called it the house of the Lord. But I was not in it, said the Lord. And so he's going to shake all of those things down. And that's going on. Because if God's got to build what he said in Ezekiel, in Ezekiel's temple in these last days, as the house of the Lord, he's got to shake down everything that is not built in God. And that's exciting. And it's going to be that. That has really just started. We're going to see so many things crumbling. Which have got the name of the Lord on them. But they weren't built in God. And they will come down. So that was the first thing. And God, you know, will shake down everything that's not built in him. And, uh, or it will just simply drift into obscurity. In verse um, 12, um, we, we, we read another verse in verse 12, and it says, the, the law of the house, you see, the law of the house, verse 43, verse 12, and this is the law of the house upon the top of the mountains, the whole limit thereof, around about shall be most holy. This is the law of the house. Holiness. Separation from that which defiles. Separation which, from that which is not of God. Separation from the Spirit of God from other spirits. From that which defiles. And see, there's so much today in the body of Christ that is not discerned, which is not the Spirit of God, it is other spirits. But says, God, that, that, that this house is going to be separated unto me. The law, you see, of this house is going to be called holiness. Now we've come in chapter, chapter 44, we, we're just touching on key, key, key words here. Chapter 44 and verse 5 it says, And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, 
Take notice, or mark well, and behold with your eyes, and hear with your ears, all that I say unto thee, concerning all the ordinances of the house of the Lord, and all the laws thereof, and mark well the entering, in the Hebrew is, mark well those who enter in. Mark well, he was saying, those who enter into this house with every going forth of the sanctuary. And uh, as we kind of read through this, we find that there's, there were a certain class of people that could only enter into the holiest of all, and these were called the sons of Zadok. And the rest of Israel and the rest of the priests could not enter into the holiest of all. And it says, these sons of Zadok then came into a place, and it says, in verse 23, it says, these shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the profane. That's real discernment. And it caused them to discern between the unclean and the clean. And in controversy, they shall stand in judgment. And they shall judge it according to my judgments. And they shall keep my laws and my statutes and my assemblies. And they shall hold on my Sabbath. That's a prophetic movement. That is the kind of a people who will judge in the house of the Lord. Teach the way, teach the difference between that which is of God and that which is of not. That which is of the Holy Spirit and that which is of another spirit. And they will discern and teach the difference. And in controversy they shall stand in judgment. And they shall judge according to my judgments. And so we see, this, this is one thing. He said, mark well those who enter in. He said, the rest will minister in the outer court. But they will not come near unto me. They will not stand in the presence of God. And he said, mark well those people who enter in. And then he begins to talk, in, and uh, I, I want to give some teaching on the sons of Zadok, because it's very uh, appropriate for this hour. And uh, there's a lot in scripture on the sons um, of, of Zadok, and it says, those who did not go astray. You know, there's a whole line running through scripture, the sons of, Deva, sons of Zadok. And it's very, very interesting, because when David was running for his life, it was only the line of Zadok that stayed with him. All of the others spoke against him and turned against him. And God forbid, God forgave them, but they said they would not enter into my presence at this level and judge my judgments. Scary stuff. And it's very, very interesting. And, and some of these priests and so on have been with David a long time. And when the crunch came, they turned against him. Okay. Now it wasn't that God didn't forgive them. He did. But he said here. He said only the sons of Zadok. Only this godly line. Those who did not go astray. said they shall stand in my presence. They shall minister unto me. And they shall discern. Between that which is right. And that which is wrong. And they shall discern between the Holy Spirit. And other spirits. And they shall stand in judgment. There's a real prophetic ministry there. That God wants to raise up. And he said just mark well. He said read this carefully. You know, in verse 10 it says, The Levites that have gone away astray from me, when Israel went astray, you know, they shall, uh, they shall bear their iniquity, yet they shall be ministers in my sanctuary, but only having charge at the gates in the outer court. Okay? Now you say, you know, oh, you're being judgmental now. No, I'm not. I'm reading God's word to you. This is the Ezekiel's tabernacle. This is the house of the Lord um, in the last days. And we have seen through this church over the last five years, these things literally happen. You see? And uh, it's not a matter of God doesn't forgive. He does. But our eternal destinies are affected. Eternal place in God. The sons of Zadok. And he said, mark well. He said, this, this temple, this end time thing of God. He said, you know, mark well those who enter in to the holiest of all and stand before me and minister unto me and so I don't have time to kind of get into all of that today but I think you get the picture and you get an understanding of that we'll, we'll look at Zadok and his line in more detail some other time okay coming into chapter 40 uh, let's see 47 we'll skip a bit here coming into chapter 47 and it says now Afterwards, he brought me again unto the door of a house. Okay, now, after what? There's afterwards. You know, there's certain things we need to take. When there's an afterwards in the Word of God, you really need to look at it. And you need to look at after what. There's, you need to look also that little word, therefore. You know, when you see a word in the scripture which says, therefore, you need to ask the question, what is the therefore, what is the wherefore, therefore? And then he comes in and says, now, wherefore, 
Oh, therefore, you need to ask the Lord, what is that there for? So it's a special mark, it's a punctuation, which means, now, having said all that, this is the result. Therefore. Now he says, afterwards. After what? Well, after the previous chapter. After chapter 46. What happened in chapter 46? They made a certain amount of offerings unto the Lord. And they made these, these offerings unto the Lord. And uh, you say, well, what offerings were these? These were the five offerings recorded in Leviticus 1 through to Leviticus 8. We've got a whole series of study on this in the, in the, in the tape library, in Leviticus, and, the, and, the, and the, these, these offerings. You need to get that if you don't know it and study it. It's a very, very important um, area of scripture. There were five offerings which Israel had to make. And God said, if you make these five offerings, he said, my glory will appear to you. It's exciting. And uh, it says that in Leviticus, Leviticus 9, 6. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you will do so that the glory of the Lord will appear to you. You want the glory of the Lord to appear to you? Make these five offerings. And so when Israel made these five offerings, the glory came down in the tabernacle. It's very exciting. And, and uh, you know, these offerings, and so he said, after they made these offerings, the river began to flow. Afterwards, he brought me again to the door of the house, and behold, I saw the waters beginning to flow from under the threshold. After these offerings in chapter 46 were made, the river began to flow in chapter 47. Now, these five offerings basically speak of a, a number of things, but they speak of a, a complete surrender of our lives to the Lord. Okay? The first offering was a burnt offering. The second offering was a meal offering. The first one dealt with that first, it dealt with those first two commandments. The, the, the burnt offering was, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy strength, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. That's a burnt offering. You die to everything else but your love for Him. He comes first in your life. That was the first offering. The second offering was a meal offering, and it involved the love of, of and, you know, our love for our neighbor and your neighbor as yourself. Those two things God requires of us above everything else. Because if we get them right, everything else flows. And these first two offerings, we don't have time. The ingredients are incredible because to speak of these two things. Then there was a peace offering which had to be made. And that peace offering spoke of coming into rest. Coming into rest. Then there was a sin offering which dealt with personal sin. Which we've been dealing with in repentance. And that kind of thing. And then there was a trespass offering. The trespass offering was very different to the sin offering. The trespass offering had to deal with dying to self. Trespass is a different word from sin. And uh, it, 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 it deals with the nature of sin in us. Not the act of sin, but our propensity. The nature, the fallen nature. When that dies, you see, these offerings speak of that. So there was a burnt offering, the meal offering, the peace, the sin, and the trespass offering complete surrender of our lives to God. And he says, after they made, made these offerings unto the Lord, the river began to flow. It's interesting. Okay, it flowed from under the threshold. Now, prophetically, this has some ramifications, it has some literal ramifications as well as spiritual. Because, you know, it's a picture, chapter 47 is a picture of the end time church. And, um, you know, this is literal, but first it has to be spiritual. You know, we have to, this is the main purport of this for us, is spiritual. This is an end time spiritual church. There's going to be an actual act of this in the end times. For instance, um, the Bible says when Jesus returns, his, his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives. There will be an earthquake and the mountain will split in two. And out of the temple, out of Jerusalem shall flow a river. You know, and it speaks of this, uh, 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 you know, in the end times. Zechariah 14, verse 4, it says, and, and his feet shall stand that day on the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in two, one towards the east, the other towards the west. And there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall be removed to the north, and the other half to the south. In other words, it will cleave, and there will be a valley. And that shall be in that day that living waters shall go out of Jerusalem, flow down into the Dead Sea, and bring life. Maybe you know the Dead Sea today is dead, it's too salty for anything. It says there's going to tell you when Jesus' feet touch the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives is going to be cleaved in two, there's going to be a great earthquake. 
and it's going to release an enormous amount of water which will form a river which will flow into the Dead Sea and the Bible says the Dead Sea will come alive possibly the, the earthquake will give an outlet to the Dead Sea as well so that there's a flow through and it speaks you know, literally about this but spiritually you know, spiritually it speaks of the end time church it must first be spiritual and Joel was talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Joel 3.18 it says it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine that's this day and the hills shall flow with milk and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth in the house of the Lord and shall water the valley of Shittim a fountain shall break out a river of waters shall break out during this outpouring of the Holy Spirit shall break out into the house of the Lord and Ezekiel was seeing this in spirit the spiritual fulfillment of this now this is twofold you know that you are what? you are the temple of the Holy Spirit okay the temple of the Holy Spirit so there's a river going to flow from you but it's also corporate you know God wants that river to flow out of your heart but also when the church comes together and people are flowing, that river is flowing from their heart, it's greatly multiplied, it's greatly amplified and God wants a river to flow from the house of the Lord now when that river begins to flow in any intensity certain things begin to happen, remember a number of weeks ago we began to talk about the Feast of Tabernacles and uh, how that on that last day, the great day of the feast, John chapter 7 verse 37 says in the last day, that great day of the feast, what feast was it? Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood and cried unto me, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come unto me and drink, and out of his what? Out of this temple shall flow a river. Now there was a partial fulfillment of that in Pentecost, but he was standing in the Feast of Tabernacles when he spoke those words. The major fulfillment of that is in the end times. There is a river, you see, out of your innermost being, out of this last temple, Ezekiel's temple, you and I, is going to flow a river of great intensity and as God's people come together corporately the flow of that river will be so intense that everything it touches will live you see and there is a river that God wants to bring forth in these last days and it's very very interesting when I talked to you about the on the Feast of Tabernacles the high priest would take a water pot about this big and it was filled with wine and water a mixture and he would pick this thing up and it would be standing on the steps of the temple and he would pour all of this water down the steps and it would fall down the steps and come down into the streets of Jerusalem and then Jesus was watching this and he couldn't stand it any longer he said you know if you come unto me on the feast of tabernacles this day he said out of your innermost being this temple is going to flow to this end time generation such a river that the world has never seen and it's going to bring life and it's going to bring blessing you know there were two harvests in scripture one was the early church and the Bible talks a lot about the harvest of Pentecost and many people were swept into the kingdom of God and uh, you know it says in Leviticus 23 about this, this, this feast Pentecost Leviticus 23 39 says on the 15th day of the 7th month uh, oh, sorry this is talking about the feast of Tabernacles on the 15th day of the 7th month when you have gathered in the fruit of the land in the midst of the feast of Tabernacles how I many of you know the church's responsibility is to gather in the fruit of the land? That's not Christians. That's the unsaved. To gather in the fruit of the land. And in the book of James it says the, the, the Lord waits, the husband man waits for the former and the latter rain so that he can gather in the fruit of the land. The former and the latter rain together. That's the Feast of Tabernacles, you see. And so that is the objective. The objective is not just to revive the church, but the river will do that. But the objective is to reach this world. The objective is to reap this harvest. And so you should gather in the fruit of the land. The 15th day of the 7th month. That was in the Feast of Tabernacles. Gathered in the fruit of the land. Exodus puts it a little different. In Exodus 23 and verse 16 it says, There will be two feasts. And the Feast of Harvest, which was Pentecost. This was the first fruits of your labors. Pentecost. What happened to Pentecost was only the first fruits. It was only one seventh of what God intended the first fruits Pentecost there was a great harvest but it was just the first fruits the 15th day it says here and the feast of harvest 
Pentecost. The first fruits of the, your labor which you have sown in the field. But he said, you'll keep another feast. And the feast of ingathering, which is at the end of the year, when you gather in the entire harvest. Oh, hallelujah. You know, something's happening in the world today. Maybe you know that now is 120 million people are being born again in Russia. 120 million people have been swept into the kingdom of God because a river flowed through that nation. Incredible. Incredible. And uh, you see, it brings life wherever it goes. Two harvests, the early church and the last day church. Now in chapter 47 here, it begins to describe, you know, what that, what that river did. In, in chapter 47, it says, And afterward he brought me again to the door of the house, and behold, the waters issued from under the threshold of the house. And, uh, and it says in verse 2, And he brought me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me by the way with, without the other gate, which is the way that looketh towards the east. You see, it was the beginning of a new day, looking towards the east. And we're in the beginning of that new day now. And it says, Then the waters began to flow. There were waters to the ankles. That's the first level. That's the first measure. And again, he said, There were waters to the knees. You know? And he went again and he said, afterwards he measured a thousand and there was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen and uh, swimming, okay? A river that could not be passed over. Okay, so that, that's the whole idea, that that river begins to increase in our midst. Now let me tell you something, the only thing that's going to increase that river is prayer. Nothing else but simply prayer will increase that river. If we don't pray, it won't increase. If we stay loyal to God and what He has called us to do, and we're diligent in prayer and seeking God and asking and seeking and knocking, that river will continue to increase. If we stop praying, it will abate again. But it says that, you know, the waters began to rise, you know, and it says in, in verse 8, and, these, and then He said unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and unto the sea. And being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall, the world, you see, run, run into the Dead Sea, the waters shall be healed. When the river reached the point of overflow, not to the ankles, but when it reached the point of overflow, we haven't reached that point, but when it reached that point of overflow, it says it ran out eastward and, and it healed, um, the waters shall be healed, humanity shall be healed. And then it says, and, every, and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, wherever that river comes, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because of the waters have come. And they shall be healed. And everything shall live where the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that fishermen shall stand, okay, and uh, begin to fish, cast forth their nets, shall be according to all their kinds of fish, a great sea, exceedingly many fish. Okay, great sea, exceedingly many. And it says, and, and by the river and upon the bank on this side and on that side shall grow all kinds of trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the, the fruit thereof be consumed, it shall, be, it shall bring forth new fruit according to its months, because the waters have come. See, because the waters have come, and there shall be healing for the nations. Medicine, the word is healing. Healing for the nations. I want to tell you, God's on the brink of doing something which will, if we fully understood it, it will blow our understanding. He is about to reach this world like never before. What we have seen to this present time is just the birth pangs of really what God is intending to do. This river, you see, is going to flow it's flowed from the house of the Lord. First of all, it has to come through the house of the Lord. Then it began to flow into the city. And it continued down into the sea. And from the sea it reached the nations. Starting in the house of God. Flowing into the nations. I don't want to go to the nations yet because we don't have what it takes. But I want to tell you, when this river flows... Hallelujah. When this thing begins to flow in God, there will be a great move of God's Spirit. It says there was a multitude of fish because the waters have come. And a great, a great multitude in the sea, exceedingly many it says. And healing shall come to the nations. 
And so we see Ezekiel's temple. See, God is establishing it. And God is raising up. He's, he's raising up a people who have been faithful and loyal to him. And, and to the house of the Lord. A people who have learned to walk carefully before God. He's re- raising up a prophetic intercessory movement. You see, who are sons of Zadok. And they'll stand before God for the nations and judge between that which is right and that which is wrong. I told the story of that guy who went to Russia the other week. You see, he, to judge in that nation, to, to, to what is right. He gave them a constitution which was accepted, a right constitution which is, was accepted by Yeltsin for the nation. See, these people are going to stand before God, the presence of God, take their orders from Him and go into the nations. You see, and it's, it's, it's an exciting thing which God is doing. There are two harvests, the early church and the last day church. And that river is beginning to flow. And this last, and it's a serious thing because this last ten years has been a qualifying period to see whether you will qualify to be sons of Zadok or just to paddle around in the outer court. And God has been sifting the heart of men and women ministers, people, situations. You see, he said, mark well who those who enter in, those who stand in this place in the last days, mark well. You see, those who enter into this, exciting, casting out the net. You see, when that river overflows, it's time to cast out the net. If we had a harvest right now, this next week, I don't know what we would do. You know, uh, we would probably lose about 90% of it. You know, and it's not, it's not, you know, one of the things the Lord is saying to me, it's, it's not that we plan to fail, we fail to plan for what God is about to do. It's not that we have in our hearts to fail, we don't, we don't plan to fail, we fail to plan. And when it happens, we are not ready. And one of the things that God is birthing in my spirit is we have to get us act together for what God is about to do. You know, when we had that move in New Zealand in Auckland in, in 1970s, we ran out of Bibles. We couldn't get enough Bibles. We were trying to get Bibles from America, from England. We couldn't get enough Bibles for the new converts. You imagine that on a scale a thousand times greater. A thousand times greater. We've got some contacts now where we can get millions of Bibles very quickly. But there's coming a day not too far away when we're going to have to do that. You see, and it's not that we, 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 we plan to let that which God is purposing slip through our fingers. We just fail to plan. We fail to prepare. God has put certain things in the Word that we don't have an understanding of what He is about to do and plan for it. And, you know, it, it is exciting. It says in Matthew 13, verse 49, it says, At the end time, the net was cast out, and I gathered in of every kind. You see, this is a net. You know, Matthew 13, 47 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore. So shall it be, the scripture says, at the end of this age. We are living there at the end of this age. You know, it's very interesting. Jesus was involved in primarily two fishing expeditions. One at the beginning of his ministry and one at the end. And um, in Luke chapter 5, right at the beginning of his ministry, he was involved in, a, in, in, in the, well, at least got the disciples involved. And it says, the net broke and the boat nearly sank. It's a real problem because, you know, it, it, it's interesting. In John chapter 21, at the end of his ministry, it says, and it, the emphasis is, they had a great catch and they marveled because the bread net did not break. You know, we've got to have a net that is not going to break. You know, that we get, you know, a thousand fish into the net and lose 900 of them. You know, and because the net breaks. And uh, this was a prophetic, this, this was prophetic, that, you know, Jesus, these are prophetic pictures to us. The, fir- the first net broke, and it speaks of the early church, the harvest, the net broke, and the church went down into the dark ages, and it didn't fulfill the purposes of God. The net broke, and uh, it, it was a problem, and, and, and it was interesting. It's interesting because God said they were cast over the nets, and because of their unbelief, they cast over one net, plural, 
And they got the whole lot into one net. You see, God is saying we can't do it on our own. God is raising up churches and people of like mind and like spirit who are going to cooperate in this harvest. <laughs> and the nets will not break. And uh, it, it's, it's exciting what God is beginning to do. But in the, the, the last, at the end of his ministry, which is prophetic, the end of this age, um, you'll find that in the life and ministry of Jesus is prophetic. What he did at the beginning was what was done in the early church. What he did at the end was what was going to be done in the end time church. And it is prophetic. The progressive, how Jesus progressed in his ministry. And uh, it's, it's, we're going to understand that this, at the end in, in, of his ministry in, in John there 21, it says that they, 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 the net didn't break and had a huge catch of fish. And it says they had in their net 153 large fish. You say, well, that's not a lot, but the size of their boat and the sizes of their nets, they were almost in trouble with this. 153 says, large, great fish. You know that number? Nothing in scripture is, is without significance, particularly in numerology. And 153 has a specific meaning. So 153 fish and 100. 50, sorry, 152 has an end time numeric significance, significance, 153, an end time significance, numeric significance, and it speaks of the fullness, the fullness of the harvest in the days of Noah, as in the days of Noah. The very interesting scriptures, uh, it speaks of, you know, 153 is nine seventeens, and nine is, speaks of completeness and fullness. Seventeen speaks of the days of Noah. And those two numerics are used in the scripture in, in describing this end time harvest. The number 9 and the number 17. The flood came on the 17th day. And the ark rested on the 17th day. And it was a picture of the days of Noah. The fullness of the end time harvest as in the days of Noah. And Jesus said just prior to his return it shall be as in the days of Noah. You see, and we see this prophetic statement in the ministry of Jesus. And... Uh, you know, the end time, we know we're living as it was in the days of Noah, shall, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. We know we're living in the days of Noah. We know that, we understand that, but there is a harvest in those days as well. It's not just as in the days of Noah, great gross darkness covering the earth, but the other side of the coin is the glory of the Lord is going to arise upon the church, and the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto you. Two sides of the coin, as it was in the days of Noah, with gross evil in the world and gross darkness, same time as a harvest. And so we understand, you know, this and, uh, and new wineskin, new kinds of nets. We have to mend the nets. Mend the nets. You know, if there's any holes in the net, you're going to start losing some of the harvest. And uh, we can't afford to do that. God's not just after conversions. He is after disciples. Angelus can make conversions, but he can't make disciples. The disciples is a whole other ballgame. Jesus said, go ye into all the world and make disciples. People who are trained will be our like him. A disciple come, becomes like those who are trained them. And you see, it's, it's going to be very, very interesting that we, we have to get these kind of nets ready. It is the time. It is the time of, of, of planning. It is the time. That we have to, and we can't do this on our own, but I believe that God is raising up a company of people of like spirit, like heart, like vision, like direction, which can get these nets in, in working order so that the harvest is not lost. And you see, in order to do this, you see, the emphasis is on now that every Christian, every believer begins to disciple, begins to share, begins to teach, begins to nurture someone else or a group of people. And... Uh, that's the only way that this can be done. It's the only way. You see, the person behind the pulpit cannot disciple the people. You might be able to disciple some of the leaders, but cannot disciple the harvest that's coming in. The people, you people, have to be in a place and you have to have the, the equipment and you have to have the, the, the ability to, to begin to train set people free, get them delivered, get them uh, into the kingdom of God in the sense of, of training them in the kingdom of God, bringing them through into the likeness of Jesus. And one of the things that God is requiring holiness of us at this present time, because disciples become exactly like the one who is discipling them. 
And that's a scary thought. And uh, they become just like you. Now that's inevitable. Because all you can only impart what you have. You see, and so it, it, it's important. And Isaiah 60 is really on the horizon. It's with us now. Arise and shine for your light has come. This is the time we have to prepare. This is the time we have to get ready. Great darkness is in the earth. Gross darkness upon the people. But the glory of the Lord is arising upon the church. And this new church. And, and the Gentiles shall come to your light. It says, then you will see what really God is been after all along. Then you will see and you will flow together. That speaks of unity. I want to tell you something. We are not going to get unity right across the body of Christ. Not at this time. But I want to tell you, God is raising up people of like mind and like spirit. And it might be a forerunner, it might be just a vanguard. But they're going to come together and there will be ministers in this city who will come together in unity and, 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 and will come together in flow, in vision and purpose. You see, and it says, you shall flow together and be enlarged. Why? Because the abundance of the sea is going to be converted unto you, the scripture said. That's the harvest. The abundance of the sea is going to be converted unto you. See, there is a river. And when it begins to flow, it makes glad the city of God. There is a river. And it flows out into this world. Everything it touches will bring life. You see, and, and we have to pay, the, you, it says that you only called Peter, they were mending their nets. And I want to tell you, we have to mend the nets, there can't be any holes in the nets. And in order to train, you know, once this river begins to flow, those churches who are really flowing in God, and are moving in God, and are obedient to God, are going to just burst at their seams. They're not going to be able to contain the myriads that will be swept into the kingdom of God. And we have to be prepared and have to virtually have the necessary things like the material to train these people. Because you're the ones who are going to have to train them. You're the ones who are going to have to disciple them. And, and we need a warehouse and start, start stockpiling it now with what is going to be required for what God is about to do in this nation. And what God is about to do in this city. And uh, it's really, really important. Next year, I want to tell you, next year I'm going to spend a lot of time in just preparing material for this next move of the Spirit of God. Because if we don't, we'll be caught unawares. We will, you know, won't have failed to plan. We'll just have planned. We, we, just have, we won't plan to fail. We'll just have failed to plan for what God's about to do. And I want to tell you, we, we, you know, it's really, really important that we hear the flow and of God's Spirit and what He is saying to us today. The abundance of the sea is going to be converted. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to revolutionize the church. And I want to tell you, overnight you're going to have a house full of babies. You have to change the nappies. You're going to have to be on call in the car in the night. You're going to have to disciple them. Because it's going to happen. And I tell you one, you know, every believer is going to have 20 or 30 or 40 people and they're going to have to train. Because without that, we will never get the job done. I want to tell you, when that begins to happen, the whole church in Perth, or those involved in what God is doing, is going to come together every week. And if it's not the entertainment center, it's going to be some other place that's big enough. And we're going to see God do a tremendous work in His Spirit. And God's laid something in my spirit. I want to tell you, if we do not prepare now, we'll be caught unawares with, the, with what God is about to do. There is a river that's going to flow. And that river is going to increase. And it says, out of you, you see, it's very important that God wants that river to flow through you. Out of your innermost being shall flow a river of life. And, and, and it's, it's important that we, this thing begins to flow and we keep it on track. Uh, and we keep, we're very discerning on what is happening so that we don't allow anything to come in to spoil what God wants to do. And he's, and he's real discerning people. And, and, and needs prophetic ministry, needs prophetic intercessors, needs people who can discern and understand what God is doing in this hour and how to keep this thing clean. But you see, God is raising up a Zadok company of people who will judge between that which is of God and that which is not of God. And that means other spirits, it means the flesh. 
so that these things can be kept clean and pure. And I want to tell you, all of the pressures, all of the trials, all of the things of the past ten years or so, and long which God has been doing in your life, is for this hour. Because God was proving and raising up a people who mature enough to handle what God wants to do. And who have qualified in their attitudes. And qualified in their behavior, one towards another. And have not spoken against or destroyed other ministries. A Zadok company of people God is raising up in this hour. Hallelujah. You know, before we had some real problems in our church, uh, a few years back, God gave me a dream one Sunday afternoon about the ministry of Zadok. And uh, I had a, a leaders meeting that night. And I shared with the leaders of, of that meeting that this was the crunch time in this church. And if the leaders don't get it right, they'll be out of that company of Zadok people. And we lost 90% of our leaders. And it was a warning from God. And God is saying today, let us be people of understanding. Let's be people who are mature. Let's be people who understand what God is saying in this hour. Nothing can stop this anymore. But we have to be ready for it. And uh, I want to tell you, you know, there is something in my spirit. When this thing is birthed in my spirit... And it is, it is fully birthed in my spirit. I know what God is going to birth. God is going to birth, birth a vision and a plan and an understanding what to do in this city. I know it. And, and it's just by the grace of God. But there's something on the inside of me. And I tell you, when that begins to be birthed, we have to move quickly and do what God is saying and prepare for this harvest. And that means preparing in the natural it means preparing in the spiritual, physical, and the spiritual. You know, it's, it's so many people are so airy fairy, they think God's going to do these wonderful things. You know, but we haven't prepared in the natural to accommodate it. We can't cope with it. Never mind the spiritual, we can't cope with it in the natural. You know, we've got to believe God. Hallelujah. And it's like God has been whittling the whole body of Christ down spiritually and, and, and kind of figuratively and to Gideon's 300 who are going to be at the forefront and break through the rest of the body can follow later but there's going to be a group of churches people and ministers in this city who will be like the forefront in Gideon's move of God and they'll break through you know and the rest will begin to follow and uh, we have to be very courageous that's why I feel very strongly about the Tuesday night meeting. We have to be courageous. We'll get a lot of flack over this. But praise God. I believe if we restore one person who's, uh, who's been unjustly ostracized in this city, we will break something open in the spirit. Yeah. And many others will follow. Amen. And if we begin to do that, we begin to obey God regardless of what other churches think. How much criticism we get, it doesn't matter because we have our eye on something greater. We have our eye on the purposes of God for this city. It doesn't matter. We're going to do the will of God. And something is going to be birthed in the spirit that will bring to pass the purposes of God. I want you to be encouraged because a river has opened. And I want to say, if we keep praying, if we keep praying, because prayer is the key, it will not happen. If we, unless we continue to pray, it will not happen, it will not be birthed. But if we continue to pray, and sometimes we can pray and pray and it seems like nothing is happening, but we continue to pray, we continue to pray, and sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy, it doesn't matter. We continue to pray, we continue to ask, we continue to knock, we continue to seek, we continue to take hold of God and say, we will not let you go until we get what we're asking of you, and we continue on, that river will begin to flow in our midst, and eventually it will overflow. And the harvest will begin to come and see, there is a river that's going to make glad this city, the city of birth, and we're going to see God do some fantastic things. Hallelujah. Praise God. Mm. Mm. I really want you to pray for me when I go to Singapore because I believe something is going to start to be released in my spirit. And it's really important, not next week, the following week, that you start praying for me from this, the Monday on. Okay? That you, you really begin to take hold of God because God wants to birth something. He wants to birth something in me. And I can't do it on my own. I need intercessors to pray. 
and, I, I, and you've got to stand with me in this because, you know, I don't want to miss the full purpose of God in this. I don't want to see it. I want to get hold of it in my spirit. Or I have pieces only. And I need to get a hold of all the plan of God. How to go about this. What God wants to do. And it's really, really important. And I want you to make a commitment in your spirit. that you. And I, you might say, well, I'm being selfish. It's good, I am. <laughs> That week, I don't want you to pray about other things unless you've got an emergency. I want you to pray for me. It's important. Because if I don't break through, this church will not. Because it comes from the top down. You know? And it comes through that. And it's very, very important. It really is important that you pray for me in this time. Particularly when I go to Singapore. Because I just have a feeling in my spirit, something's going to break. Uh, and, and things are going to be established in connection to networks and in my own spirit so that next year this thing will begin to flow.